What if I told you that just three years ago, the land where planes now proudly taxi was nothing more than dust? No terminals, no fleet, no national colors painted on aircraft. Only a dream, and in the eyes of many critics, a foolish one. Today, that dust has transformed into a national airline that doesn't just fly passengers. It carries the weight of a revolution, a vision of sovereignty, and the audacity of a nation that refused to remain grounded. President Ibrahim Traoré of Burkina Faso did something that has left the world, especially the West, in disbelief. In a dramatic and deeply symbolic moment, Burkina Faso unveiled the first fully African-made airplane, built entirely on African soil, with African minds and hands. No foreign outsourcing, no imported skeletons, rebranded as local, no symbolic assembly just for headlines. This is Africa's own, fully, completely, unapologetically. And yes, it flew. The launch took place in the capital city of Ouagadougou, where thousands of citizens, engineers, journalists, and military officials gathered under a clear Sahelian sky. As the engines roared to life, the crowd grew silent, and then it lifted, not just off the runway, but into symbolism, legacy, and a future Africa was long denied. Burkina Faso, a landlocked country long written off as one of the poorest in West Africa, has done something its detractors thought impossible. In the midst of political upheaval, Ikawa sanctions, and relentless pressure from foreign powers, the country planted a flag in the sky. This isn't simply about airplanes. It's about reclaiming dignity, building infrastructure where none existed, and sending a signal to the world. Burkina Faso will no longer wait for handouts to determine its destiny. The story begins in 2022, when the country was still reeling from sanctions following the rise of Captain Ibrahim Traoré. Airports across the region were dominated by foreign carriers. Burkinabe passengers traveling abroad often had to route through Lom, Accra, or Abidjan, paying premium prices to foreign airlines for the simple right to travel. For decades, the absence of a national carrier symbolized dependence. Every ticket purchased was a reminder that Burkina Faso's mobility, like its economy, was tied to someone else's mercy. But in the dust of Ouagadougou's old runways, a new idea was taking root. The transitional government made a bold declaration. Burkina Faso would establish a national airline within three years. To many, it sounded reckless. How could a country facing sanctions, terrorism, and economic blockade dare to dream of aviation? But that's exactly why it mattered. Building an airline wasn't just about flights. It was a direct challenge to the narrative that poor nations must wait for permission to modernize. To grasp the weight of this decision, imagine being in a village where everyone depends on a single well, owned and controlled by outsiders. Each day, people line up to beg for water, sometimes being told, not today. One day, the village chief declares, we will dig our own well. The skeptics laugh. They say it's too costly, too technical, too ambitious. But when that well begins to pour water, it changes not just access, it changes pride, power, and independence. That's what a national airline means to Burkina Faso. The first planes arrived in 2024 under hushed negotiations with partners who saw opportunity in the new African order. While Echo was threatened isolation, secret trade deals with allies outside the bloc, Russia, Turkey, and even certain Gulf states brought planes, technical expertise, and fuel contracts. It was risky, but necessary. For every airliner painted in Burkina's colors, there was a deeper message. Sanctions may close doors, but vision opens runways. By late 2024, the airline had completed its first international test flight to Bamako, then to Niamey, carrying not only passengers but also a symbolic declaration of regional solidarity. Mali and Niger, also ostracized by ECOWAS, opened their skies, and together with Burkina Faso they began weaving an aviation corridor independent of traditional West African hubs. It was more than business, it was geopolitics in the sky. Three years ago, dust. Today, a national airline. Tomorrow, a question. What else can be built from nothing? And that, perhaps, is the real shocker. This airline is not just about transportation. It's about rewriting the rules of who gets to fly, who gets to own, and who gets to dream. Before we move into the deeper layers of how this airline connects to Burkina Faso's broader revolution, I want to hear from you. Do you think building a national carrier in the middle of sanctions and crises was reckless? Or was it the bold step Africa needed to prove sovereignty? 
Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video so more people can join this conversation. When Captain Ibrahim Traore seized power in 2022, the headlines across the world screamed, another coup in West Africa. What they didn't see was the foundation of a revolution that went beyond politics. Traore wasn't only challenging corrupt elites, he was redefining how a nation should stand on its own feet. The national airline became one of the clearest symbols of that fight. For decades Burkina Faso had been told to focus on basics by the IMF and World Bank. Basics meant subsistence agriculture, scraping by on aid packages and relying on neighbors for access to the world. Airlines were for bigger economies, they said. Ambition was discouraged because ambition made poor nations harder to control. But under Traore, Burkina Faso decided that flying was basic. Mobility, trade and international presence were as necessary as food and water. The airline's development was tied to something bigger, the push for economic sovereignty. At the same time plans for the fleet were being drawn, Burkina Faso was building oil storage depots to escape foreign dependency, constructing toll stations to fund its own infrastructure, and negotiating new trade corridors with Mali and Niger. Each of these projects fed into the others. An airline without local fuel storage would collapse. A national airline without roads feeding passengers into airports would fail. Traore's government understood this, and for the first time infrastructure wasn't scattered, it was part of a whole. But the birth of the airline wasn't without enemies. Ikawas had already isolated Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger. Nigeria's leadership warned that the three nations were gambling with the future. Foreign media mocked the idea of Burkina Faso running its own planes, painting it as reckless nationalism. Yet inside the country, the opposite was happening. Citizens saw their flag on a plane's tail fin and realized, for the first time, Burkina Faso wasn't just renting seats on someone else's future. Behind the scenes, the deals that made the airline possible were not the kind ECOWAS or the West wanted revealed. Moscow provided technical advisors. Ankara offered maintenance contracts and some Gulf financiers invested discreetly, betting on Africa's new independence movement. These weren't loans with chains attached, they were partnerships based on survival and shared resistance to Western dominance. That's why the airline quickly became more than transportation, it became a statement of alignment in a changing world order. Think of it this way. When Ghana launched its independence airline in 1958 under Kwame Nkrumah, it wasn't just about flights to London or Lagos. It was about showing that colonial rule was truly over. In the same way, Burkina Faso's airline in 2025 isn't just about flying passengers to Bamako or Niamey. It's about proving that the age of silent dependence is closing. Inside the country, the impact was immediate. Jobs were created not only for pilots and cabin crew, but also for engineers, mechanics, ground staff, and vendors at newly revived airports. For a nation whose youth had been fleeing in desperation to Europe, the airline became a literal runway for dignity at home. Each paycheck signed by the airline was one less family forced to beg for opportunity abroad. And perhaps most critically, the airline became a psychological weapon. Terror groups had long thrived on the narrative that the state was weak, incapable of providing progress. But when Burkinabe saw gleaming aircraft with their national colors lifting into the sky, something changed. It wasn't just planes rising, it was morale. Yet the risks were real. Maintenance costs were crushing. International insurers demanded high premiums. Competitor airlines tried to block access to routes. And still, Burkina Faso pressed on. Why? Because Traore's vision wasn't to make an airline that turned a profit overnight. It was to carve a place for Burkina Faso in the air, just as he was carving one for it on the ground. So three years after the dream was announced, the airline is now a flying piece of the revolution a symbol that even under sanctions, a nation can create, organize, and lift itself. But the bigger question remains, how does this fit into the larger geopolitical storm shaking West Africa? Because while passengers see flights, leaders see alliances, and enemies see threat. When Burkina Faso announced the launch of its national airline in the middle of crippling sanctions, the move stunned observers across Africa and beyond. To many, it seemed like the country was poking a sleeping giant. ECOWAS. The West African bloc that had already shown it was willing to squeeze nations into submission. Yet to Captain Ibrahim Traore and his government, the airline was never just about moving passengers. It was about rewriting the balance of power in the skies, 
sending a message that sovereignty was not negotiable. Sanctions as shackles. To understand the magnitude of this decision, we must revisit the sanctions. After Traore took power in 2022, ECOWAS, led by Nigeria, imposed harsh restrictions, closing borders, freezing financial flows, and even limiting airspace. For an already fragile, landlocked country like Burkina Faso, this was a stranglehold. The aim was simple, to starve the government into surrender. But in trying to cage Burkina Faso, ECOWAS created the perfect conditions for rebellion. Think of sanctions as shackles placed on a runner. The more you tighten them, the more determined he becomes to break free. For Burkina Faso, breaking free meant finding new partners, building new systems, and most importantly, ensuring that no outsider would again hold the keys to its skies. Birth of the AES Alliance The isolation pushed Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger into each other's arms. Out of desperation came unity, the Alliance of Sahel States, AES. Suddenly, three landlocked nations that had been treated as afterthoughts were forming a bloc strong enough to challenge regional powers, and aviation became their front line. Why? Because air travel is more than convenience, it is economic lifeblood. Without control of the skies, trade routes collapse, medical supplies get delayed, and national dignity erodes. ECOWAS knew this when it tried to choke access. But by launching its own airline, Burkina Faso essentially said, we no longer need your permission to breathe. The skies as a battlefield. Let's be clear, the airline was not born in peace. It was born in war. The silent war of sanctions, trade disputes, and geopolitical pressure. Each flight out of Ouagadougou was more than transport. It was defiance. When the new airline began serving routes between Ouagadougou, Bamako, and Niamey, it wasn't just carrying passengers. It was weaving together the AES bloc into a seamless network bypassing ECOWAS hubs like Accra, Lagos, and Abidjan. This was revolutionary. For decades, West Africa's skies had been dominated by outsiders. Air France, Brussels Airlines, and Turkish Airlines were the gatekeepers. If you wanted to fly from Ouagadougou to Dakar, you might have to transit through Paris first. It was humiliating and expensive. The new Burkinabe Airline shattered that model, offering direct connections where none existed before. Imagine being a Burkinabe trader who once had to pay double fares and endure humiliating stopovers abroad just to do business in neighboring Mali. Suddenly, a direct national flight makes your journey affordable, efficient, and dignified. That is not just convenience, it is transformation. Resistance and pushback. Of course, such defiance did not go unanswered. Nigeria's aviation authority raised alarms about unregulated carriers, warning that safety could be compromised. Ghana's foreign minister questioned Burkina Faso's technical capacity. International insurers hiked premiums, citing regional instability. Spare parts for aircraft, many of which are manufactured in Europe, became suspiciously harder to acquire. None of this was accidental. It was economic warfare in disguise. The goal was to pressure the fledgling airline into collapse, to send a message that no African nation could go it alone without consequences. But Traore and the AES were prepared. Russia provided aviation experts and helped train engineers. Turkey offered maintenance contracts and technical support. Gulf financiers discreetly invested, betting on Africa's new independence movement. These partnerships allowed the airline to sidestep traditional Western supply chains, reducing dependence on systems that could be weaponized. And multiply this model across multiple industries, rail, energy, telecoms, and you begin to see the architecture of a new Africa taking shape. Of course, challenges remain, aviation is notoriously expensive. One bad crash, one misstep in safety standards could destroy credibility. Corruption could seep in if transparency is not maintained, and global powers will not sit idly by as Africa shifts its trajectory. The fight will be long and the skies will not always be clear, yet the symbolism remains unshakable. Three years ago, there was only dust. Today, there is a national airline. Tomorrow, perhaps, a continental aviation network run entirely by Africans. The path has been opened. What Burkina Faso has done is more than logistics. It's defiance. It's vision. It's a dare. A dare to other African nations to stop waiting for handouts, to stop believing the lie that sovereignty is too expensive. It's a dare to the young African generation that the future is not something to be imported, it is something to be built. And maybe that is why this story matters beyond Burkina Faso, beyond West Africa, beyond even the AES, because it speaks to the heart of the African struggle. 
to move from being passengers on someone else's journey to being pilots of our own destiny. So, when you next see a Burkinabe plane lifting off the runway, remember, this isn't just an aircraft. It's a manifesto in motion, a declaration written not in speeches but in wings, engines, and courage. The dust has risen and it will not settle again. Now I want to hear from you. Do you see Burkina Faso's airline as a model other African nations should follow? Or is it a fragile gamble that might collapse under pressure? Drop your thoughts in the comments, subscribe for more deep reporting like this, and share this video with someone who needs to understand Africa's new story.